Well, again, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, God's doing some good things, and I'm glad you're a part of it. It's good for us to be together, and whether you're joining us online, I mean, the many people joining us online or over at Stone Creek or either of our two services here, um, I'm glad you're part of Flipside. I want to continue to encourage you to invite your huddle. Uh, you have people in your life, in your spheres of influence, uh, that God's placed in your life and you and theirs. They'll listen to you. Uh, they'll follow you many times, and so let's all make sure we're following, uh, inviting them to follow Christ uh, through Flipside. It's a good. It's good for us to be together this morning. Thank you. Um, I had a great week up in Portland, uh, doing one of our church plant discovery centers uh, for people who feel called to plant a church and discerning together through a multitude of counselors and and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who God has called and set apart for ministry. And I was remembered uh, at that assessment center, kind of how God works uh, and brings things full circle. Um, there was, uh, back in 1995, I took a, a, a mission trip with the group to Costa Rica. And, and God did some incredible things on that mission trip. There were four of us guys who went, just four of us. I only knew one of them. Uh, and, and it was on that trip that God did some incredibly miraculous supernatural stuff uh, through me and through us. Had the privilege of praying over someone who had lost his sight and lost all their money in doctors and who couldn't see anymore and had the privilege of putting my hands on him and praying him and him falling over on the ground and getting his sight back. It was, it was crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, had the privilege of being in a prison where the night before someone had cut out one of the inmates' hearts uh, and they locked the prison down and said that people weren't allowed to go into the prison and be with the inmates. It was so incredibly one of the most violent prisons in Costa Rica. And, um, and uh, I, I told him, I said, well, I believe I'm here, I, I'm here on assignment, and so I uh, am invincible. And so I want you to open up the doors and let me walk amongst the men. Uh, and so we did. The God did some incredible things. Uh, while we were there, and one of the guys that was with us, I roomed with in 1995. And since I came back from that mission trip, and in 27 years, I've never, never been able to find him. It just, just cut off all. I, I didn't know how to get a hold of him. He led worship for us, a dynamic man, and is super, super humble. And and I walk into this discovery center in Portland, Oregon, and he has the same last name as the guy I was with in Costa Rica. And he's there with his wife. They're both about my age and tells me he's planting a church up in Arcata. And that's where these guys were from that I was with. And I'm like, what? And his name's Justin. I said, Justin, do you know a guy named John? I talked about who we were there with. He said, well, yeah, I used to do ministry stuff with him all the time. I said, okay, hold on now. Did you go to Costa Rica with a group of four guys in 95? He said, yeah. I'm like, Justin. This is me. <laughs> like we lived together in Costa Rica that whole trip. And, and it was so amazing to get to see and hear what God had been doing in his life for these 27 years. Uh, and God had taken him through some stuff, allowed him to be in some stuff, got him out. of It was just an amazing, amazing story of God's sovereign hand and him trusting God. And God's sovereignty, and, and, and hearing the story kind of full circle now, him being a part of the Discovery Center and, and, and being one of our, soon, one of our church, church planters. I just really, really, like, the, the more I get to be around God and, and his hand, the more and more and more I'm convinced we would do so well if we got our controlling fingers off stuff and let him do his thing. When does difficulty become really, really hard and dangerous? If God is good, does he keep us out of difficulty so it doesn't become hard and dangerous? If, if God doesn't keep us out of difficulty, does he at least keep us out of Real perilous danger? 
If God is good, wouldn't he move his hand on our behalf so we don't have to go through really difficult and dangerous times and things? I was thinking about these things this week. When does difficulty, when is difficulty not worrisome? Don't say Jesus. That seems to be the answer in church, right? Oh, it's Jesus. Well, well, when is difficulty not here? I'm going to tell you when difficulty is not worrisome. Difficulty is not worrisome when you have the solution to the difficulty. Would you agree? We stop worrying about the difficulty when we have the solution. When is danger not worrisome? Danger is not worrisome when we know it's not deadly. Like we can go through any difficulty and any danger as long as we know we got the solution, it's going to be okay, right? Here's what I know. Every one of us is wired this way. We all handle difficulty better and not so fearful of danger when we have a solution to the difficult situations and know we've got a future that's secure. Every one of us, it's just how we're, I mean, we all handle difficulty and danger better. When we know we got a solution, there's a solution to it, and we got our future secure. I was thinking about it, like how I understand this in my world. Like for me, I'm not a math guy. I do okay with addition. I'm pretty good with subtraction. I got to think a little bit about division. But when math become, moves from numbers to letters and symbols, that's where I'm lost. And if math involves a lot of words, I, 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 I'm just not there. And, and so, it, and so under, how we understand this principle is it's like a hard math problem. Like in the old days of textbooks, at the end of every chapter, there was a chapter test in the back of the book. And those of us who are not good at math knew the secret to the test in, in the, the chapter because at the back of the book was the, the answers. But it wasn't all the answers. It was just the answers to the odd-numbered problems. And so I could run up against a difficulty in math and be okay with it because I knew that when I didn't want to deal with the difficulty anymore, I had the solution ready at hand. Right? If only life worked that way. If only life worked that way. Dealing with difficult math problems is one thing. But when we deal with difficulty and danger in life, it's quite another. When we don't see the solution, nor do we perceive a secure future, it can be terrifying and lead to a great deal of anxiety. Would you agree? And when one faces difficulty, danger, scarcity, any of those issues, when one faces those things and when one is a spiritual person, it begs the question of God's sovereignty. How much of this is he controlling? How much of this is he allowing? Does God controlling the difficulty that I'm in right now? If so, I want to know where the solution is, right? Is God allowing this difficulty I'm in right now to threaten my finances, my family, my relationships, my life? If so, I want to know what future do I have to look forward to? And so this series, Control Freaks. This series, Control Freaks, is designed for, for those people who believe hmm, that if I'm in control, I'm safe. And many of us are wired this way. Like if I can just get my hands on it, if I can just make the decisions for it, if I can just make everybody else's decision around it, if I can manipulate things according to my will, everything's going to be okay. Now, are any of you sitting next to someone who's like that? <laughs> I won't ask if you are. Most of us, we, we honestly believe that if we can just get our hands on something, it's going to be okay. Some people so badly 
want to have control, that if they don't have control, they at least want knowledge. I, I at least want to know. Have, do any of you use the, um, <laughs> I, I'm going to step on some toes. I apologize up front. Do any of you use one of those little parent things that tells you where your kids are and how fast they're driving and if they're braking too hard and who they're with? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, now that might be necessary for some of your kids. I've met them. But sometimes, sometimes, well, it's, it's this desire to, I, if I can get my hands on them, I can, I can make sure that, but if I can't get my, at least I need to know. Because we like control. So, and when we live in that world, or when we're in a scenario in our lives, for which we are the end all for all questions. See, some of you work in an environment where you are the stopgap because of whatever reason of everybody's question. You have to make the decision. Like every question comes back to you and you're responsible for every decision. Hour after hour after hour, moment after moment after moment. And when we live in this world of constantly having to be the one to make all decisions, it can lead to a thing, it's a legitimate thing called decision fatigue. And we're just tired of making decisions. We're, 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 our lives are surrounded by nothing but questions from us, and we alone bear the responsibility for the decisions. And it doesn't take long to develop decision fatigue. Where, where you just come to the place in life, I can't make one more decision. Have any of you been there? Like if that's your work environment, whenever it is during the evening when you finally get a clock out, you come home and you're like, I don't want to make one, I don't care what we eat, I don't care what we watch, I don't care what we do, I don't care who comes over, I don't even care where I sit on the couch, I just can't make another decision. We've all been there. And, and, and when we get to that place, of either either the, the innate desire to be in control or being forced to be in control. And it's overwhelming and we just get to the place so I can't make any other decision. All we want is someone else to make a decision for us. And that's good as long as when that one makes a decision for us, we relinquish control and are good with going along with whatever's decided. The problem is, some of us are such control freaks that though we're tired of the control, it's very difficult to release control. And then when someone makes decisions on our behalf, even when it's God, we're not always okay with it. In this series, we're looking at accounts in the Bible that have as their foundation piece this thing called the sovereign decision of God. And this sovereignty of God and this providential sovereignty, we may miss this very deeply embedded theological piece if we're not looking for it. We can read the Bible, hear something from the Bible, read a story, hear a story, hear someone teaching it, and miss this deeply profound issue of God's sovereignty if we're not careful. But anyone who's serious about their faith, serious about growing in their relationship with God, serious about growing in their knowledge of God, must become aware of this issue of God's sovereignty and find peace in submission to it somehow. And so let's look at an account, and we're going to see what's going on in the Bible, and we're gonna, then we're going to unpack it and consider what it means about God's sovereignty. You ready? So what we're going to look at is one of the miracles in the Bible uh, in the in the in the Gospels, there's very few there's very few uh, miracles and events uh, that's listed in all four Gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Very few. This is one of them. And one of the miracles that's listed in all four Gospels is the feeding of the multitudes: Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, and John 6. The miracle of feeding the multitudes, as we read it in the Gospels is not the first time the miracle of feeding the multitudes happened in the Bible. It didn't, if I can say it this way, it didn't originate with Jesus. Do any of you know where the first feeding of the, uh, of the multitudes happened? 
It's because you don't come to my Bible study on Wednesday nights. We studied First and Second Kings, and in Second Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44, is the first miraculous feeding of the multitudes. And the Bible says this. A man came from Baal Shalashah, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of some new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. So here's what's happening. Elisha's there with a hundred men. They're trying to do the work of God and grow in God and following God. And they're faced with a situation where they have no food. Except for a hundred little, about this big, a hundred little loaves of barley bread. hundred people. Elisha says, well, give it to them. Well, how can I set this before a hundred men, his servant asked. But Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and they'll have some left over. Sound familiar? Then he said it before them, all the hundred men, they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. So this was the first time that God moved in this miraculous way and took a little bit of food and fed the multitudes. It was a foreshadowing of who Jesus is and would be and what he would do. And so we fast forward now to the New Testament, the book of John chapter 6, and we see a very similar thing, just larger. Because that was a shadow, this is reality. Sometime after this, after what? After Jesus had been ministering in a community and healing all kinds of people, Jesus crossed to the other, uh, uh, to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. And Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with the disciples. So let me just again set the stage here. Jesus had been ministering and healing all kinds of people, healing all kinds of sick people. And so people saw what was going on. They're like, oh, we got to get more of this Jesus guy, man. Look, this is incredible what he can do. And Jesus is like, okay, I need to get away from you all for a little bit. and get. Have you ever been at those times in life when people are just clamming after you, clamming after you, and you just need to get away? And so he gets away, goes up on this mountainside, and calls his disciples around him. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd uh, coming towards him, he said to Philip, one of his disciples, where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? He asked this only to test him because he already had in mind what he's going to do. And so again, just up on his hill, the disciples around him, sees all these people. Now we know from scripture it's about 5,000 men. You add women and children that we're talking about 20,000 people. That's a lot of people. All coming towards him. And he's looking at him and he's saying, okay, they're following me and they're walking into this place of scarcity and need and difficulty. I need to do something. He obviously knew that they're walking into scarcity because he already had a mind what he was going to do. You understand that? And so he says, Philip, how are we going to solve this? It wasn't a question of ignorance. This was a question of faith and strategy. He knew. Philip answered him. I don't know. (laughs) It'd take half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Just a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But what good is that? Got all these thousands of people. It's interesting to me. That we're so accustomed to seeing the scarcity in every opportunity. Like they're with Jesus. He alone is enough to provide. And then they get a little bit and they still see the scarcity. I, I wonder what would happen to us, God's people and God's church, if in every scarcity we saw the opportunity. Do you understand? It seems as though we've been functioning from a, a, a place of scarcity and attitude of loss for the past long while. Rather than seeing the difficulty and scarcity as a great opportunity. If we just give it into God's hands, we'll see what he can do. 
Jesus said, all right, here's the deal. Y'all have the people sit down. There's a bunch of grass. We've got plenty of space. And they sat down, about 5,000 men. You had the women and children, talking about 20,000 people. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks. Sounds like communion, right? Jesus was a master at giving thanks and breaking bread. Like something always good happened when he did that. Distributed to those who, who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. Replaying the miracle that happened in the Old Testament. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled how many baskets? Interesting. How many disciples? Interesting. Uh, with the, from the five pieces of, of the barley loaves that were left over uh, after they had eaten it all. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, what in the world is going on? Surely, this is a prophet. This is the one that's coming to the world. Like, this is a... Let me ask this question. What, 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 do people follow Jesus without hope of getting something from him? I don't know. I just know me. I know I don't follow Jesus without the hope of getting something from him. And I would wager to bet that none of you, none of us follow Jesus without the hope of getting something. Is that good or bad? <laughs> so sometime after Jesus had been healing, he leaves and goes to this little solitary place to be alone. And all these people start clamoring after him because why? Not because of who he was, but because they saw what he did. Because they saw him heal. Is it authentic faith simply to follow Jesus because of some miracle? I want you to wrestle with this a little bit. You know what I think? I think it absolutely is. Let me explain. There's no follower of Jesus that doesn't follow Jesus without a miracle. It's called the resurrection. Do you understand? Every one of us who follow Jesus, follow Jesus because we believe in a miracle. The resurrection from the dead. It's absolutely authentic to say, where else are we going to go? Who else has done this? <laughs> Find anybody else who has done what Jesus has done and go ahead and follow him. You won't find anybody else. Everyone who follows Jesus does so because of a miracle, and that miracle is a resurrection. And because that happened, let's follow him and see what else he can do. Do you understand? It's exactly what these people are doing. Wow. Let's keep following him and see what else. And so they do. And that's when Jesus looked at them. So all these people and figured they're following me. They have a need because they're following need. How are we going to solve this? In his mind, he already knew what he was going to do. Jesus knew where he was. He left to go to this remote place out of the way. He knew that it was a place that had no sustenance around him. He saw the people coming to be with him because they wanted more of him. And he knew that they were going to come to him. And he knew that because they were coming to him, they were going to be in great need. It's interesting to me as I read this, there's no note that the disciples even brought their own food. Like the disciples didn't even. And I wonder if with the disciples, if they were so used to Jesus meeting all their needs, they just like, yeah, whatever, just take care of it. The Bible says that they were in this place of need. They were in this place of scarcity because they were following Jesus and Jesus knew that they would be in this place of need, difficulty, and scarcity. Because it says he had already planned ahead of time what he was going to do. 
See, the way this played out, Philip said, we don't have the resources to meet this need. Andrew Simon said, well, we got, I stole a kid's lunch and so we got a little bit. But it's still not enough. See, the others around, see, we, we know because the narrative tells us that Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do. How many of the people around him knew that he had a plan for what he was going to do? How many? None. Had he brought any of them into his inner circle and asked their advice on how to handle this? No. No. Did he tell any of them ahead of time, look, we're going to get into some rough spots, but don't worry, I got it handled. Did he say that? No. He had a plan, but those around him didn't know for a fact that he had. Those around him couldn't see the plan. And so what they saw, because they couldn't see the plan, is they saw the need and the scarcity. Even with what they had, all they saw was not the provision, but the need. They even saw what they had as still part of the problem. And so, Jesus said, listen. Have people sit down. Jesus took the bread and the fish. And he gave thanks. He said, I've done my part, now you do your part. Go pass this out. And they passed it out, and everybody had as much as they wanted. Though Jesus had a plan, the people had to work it out. He had the plan, he had the power, he had the provision, but they had to take action. Do you understand that? There's always personal responsibility within God's plan. There's always personal responsibility within God's plan. Does God have the power? Absolutely. But within that plan is our personal responsibility. Here's, here's what we have to understand. That in every plan of God, there's the personal responsibility of his people. L let that sink in. With every plan of God, there's the personal responsibility of his people. God doesn't see our need and say, I'll tell you what, sit back, don't do a thing, I'm going to take care of it all, you're responsible for nothing. He never says that. There's always, I have the plan, I have the power and provision, you have some responsibility. God sees our need, he says, I have the plan, I have the power and the provision, but you have to exercise some faith and move according to it. Now, there's a lot of people who get to these places of scarcity and need and difficulty and ask others to pray for it, and which is fine. But oftentimes in the request for prayer, there's the lack of changing personally the areas that need help. Do you understand? So many people say, God, I have this need, and I only have power and provision, so just show up and do something. And God says, look, I can, but I won't until your feet move in concert with my will. There's always personal responsibility involved. So do you pray over your need? Absolutely. And then you change your life to start stepping God's way. There's always this participation piece. With God, within God's plan. Do you understand that? I can't overstate that enough. And what's interesting in this, in this little tidbit here in verse 12, when they had had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. Why would he say that? They'd already had enough. I think for a couple reasons. Now follow me. I think one, because they wanted the people to be reminded again of God's abundancy. It's not just that people had enough. They had enough and there was a ton left over. 
But not only that, I think Jesus was, and, and, and an entire custom grew out of this within the Jewish people. An entire custom grew out of this. That it became customary law not to waste food, because to waste food was to waste God's goodness and provision. See, when we understand that every good thing comes from the hand of the Father, the idea was that to waste what comes from the Father's hand is to waste his grace and his provision. And so when God decides to reveal his plan to work with us and to start to move, that's to be honored, not taken for granted, not wasted, but understood, appreciated, and honored. See, what happens when God moves that way, they gathered this and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of fish uh, of, of, of the five barley loaves uh, left over by those who had eaten. What, what happens is that when God moves according to his plan, it always includes abundance. The plan of God always includes abundance. Abundance. It's the Bible and it's Jesus that says that when we give, God returns it, pressed down, shaken together, making room for overflow, abundance. It's Jesus who said, I've come that you might have life and life in abundance and all fullness. It's God that always plans for abundance. See, here's what we have to remember regarding sovereignty. Sovereignty is what led the people to a place of scarcity. Let's not, let's not gloss over that. It's the sovereignty of God that led the people to this place of, of, of scarcity. Either led them to it or allowed it. Either way, it was at the sovereign hand of God. But it was also the sovereign plan for abundant provision. See, these two things often go hand in hand in the Bible. By God's sovereignty, he may allow us to get to the place of great need, great difficulty, even great danger. But it's also his sovereignty that, that works through that to a place of great abundance. We see it in the Bible over and over and over. And when God allows us to be in place in need, what he's asking us to do is to submit to his sovereignty in that moment by not worrying about a thing, but by praying with thanksgiving. Why? Because Jesus already has in mind what he's going to do. Now, I need to make this really clear distinction when we're in times of scarcity and difficulty. We must know beyond a shadow of a doubt that every time we follow God, that's the key, every time we follow God, every time we're obedient, every time we're following Jesus, and we get to a place of scarcity and difficulty and need because of it, God already has a plan for abundant provision. The caveat is every time because we're following God, every time because we're doing life is every time because we're obeying scripture, we're following Jesus. Every time because of that, we get to a place of scarcity and difficulty. God already has a plan and that plan always involves abundant provision. But please understand, not every time we experience difficulty, not every time we experience scarcity, not every time we get in trouble, but every time because we're following Christ. That's the difference. Every time God leads us into a place of difficulty and scarcity because of obedience, he's got a plan that's going to be abundant. But let's realize, it's not that these people ran into trouble because they, you know, because they just simply walked out on their own, thought they'd go for a day walk, and all of a sudden they decided they were overexposed and didn't have any water. It's not that they got into trouble because they were either ignorant or arrogant. It's not because they got in trouble because they made some stupid decision. They got into a place of scarcity and difficulty because they were following Jesus. And when we get in those places of difficulty and scarcity because they're following Jesus, he takes responsibility for our provision. This works in every area in your finances. You start doing it God's way and it gets tough. God's going to work it out. He, he accepts responsibility. 
in your marriage, you start doing stuff right and it starts going haywire, don't worry about it. God's going to work that out. In your job, you start doing that stuff God's way, don't worry. You might hit some rough spots, but God's leading you in that because you're following him. He takes responsibility for your provision. Don't worry. Do you understand that? But when we get stupid and ignorant and arrogant and go on our own away from him, thinking we got this on our own and we get into trouble, God's under no obligation anymore. Does that make sense? You understand this? And so many of us read this type of stuff. And we think, oh, God's just going to provide it because he loves me. And sometimes he goes, well, what's that time out? I didn't ask that of you. You didn't get there because I, I led you. Like, If we lead ourselves into scarcity and difficulty, because of God's grace, he may intervene, but he's under no obligation. But, but there are some of the stuff that we have to accept great, a great deal of personal responsibility and work. Our tails off. And in the midst of our own stuff, then we pray to the Father for his mercy and grace to be profoundly given to us even though we don't deserve it. You understand? You follow me so far? You okay? So here's the truth. Many times, many times, when we follow Jesus and we do stuff God's way, in God's sovereignty, he leads us and allows us into times of difficulty scarcity, and maybe even danger. So we'll learn to submit and trust him in the middle of it. See, when we talk about these things of scarcity and difficulty, that is our perspective of what we're going through. Did you know that God has no verbiage for difficulty Difficulty is not in God's vocabulary. So when we see things from a, a perspective of scarcity and difficulty, that's from our perspective, not God's. And so when God has allowed us and taken us into those moments, we ought not see them as scarcity and difficulty as much as opportunity because we've submitted to his sovereignty. When you're walking with Jesus... We can walk into scarcity. We can walk into difficulty without fear. Why? Because with Jesus comes a plan, and with that plan comes provision. The only thing he asks of us is to walk in step with him and submit to his sovereignty. That's what's at issue today. When we follow Jesus and submit to God's sovereignty, there's no danger in that. None. And so, come up here, Jared. If you're in a place, in a position of difficulty or scarcity in any area of your life, because you're following Jesus, submit to God's sovereignty right now. And do what's right God's way. And then live with complete freedom and joy. Because God's got a plan. And it does involve abundance. Do you understand? This is the story of the good news. Us being in a position of need. Walking into God's plan of salvation in Christ and abundant life on the other end of it. And so I, I want to lead us in a time of prayer for two different groups of people. And, and, and I guarantee you that, that every one of us fits in one of these two groups. One of those groups are, are those of us who have walked ourselves away from God and into trouble, and it's our fault. And the other group are those who are walking with Jesus, and you know you are. And you still hit that scarcity and difficulty. 
I, I want to pray with both of those groups. And so if you'll just for a moment center yourself down and in the honesty of your own heart, j- just do your own assessment. Is the difficulty, the scarcity, the fear, the need, is that because of me? I've, I've done my own thing. I've gone my own way. It, either my ignorance or arrogance. I just got myself in a hole, man. If, if that's you, let me pray over you and you kind of echo this in your own heart. Father, there's some of us who have walked away and and veered off and either because of our arrogance or our ignorance, done stuff on our own and boy, we're in the thick of it now. And, and seems as hard as we try, we can't get out of it and and if we're honest with ourselves, it's our own fault. Father, I, pr- I, pr- I pray over, over those who are in that spot that you would so lavish your mercy and your grace. Though we are so undeserving of rescue, though we are so undeserving of help, though we are so undeserving of favor, I ask because of who you are, not because of who we are. I ask because of who you are in spite of what we've done, that you would lavish, that you would overflow, that you would saturate us as undeserving as we are with your mercy and your grace. We don't deserve it, we admit it. But Father, some of us have no other place to go. We've heard what you've done. We've seen what you've done. And we want to see more of it for us. So by your mercy and your grace, be merciful and gracious to us. Forgive us. Choose to be abundant towards us. And as you do that, Father, cause our hearts to fall in love with you. There's another group here, and this is you, and you know you're right with God. You know you've been walking in step with him. There's nothing in your life you need to confess. But boy, you've run into it too. And and you have to know that if that's you, Jesus has a plan, and it's a plan of abundance. Just submit to what you're going through right now because you know it's from his hand. And and if that's you, I would just encourage you to say in this moment, Father, I I would have scripted things differently for me than what it seems you've allowed or scripted. But I'm going to choose to submit. Right now in the midst of this, I'm going to choose to submit. I'm going to confess that you're sovereign and I'm not. And I'm going to keep doing what I know to be right. And if I need to do something different, please let me know. But while I submit to you and change what I need to change. Father, help me live with great freedom and joy. The relinquishing of control into your great and mighty hand. Help me live with freedom and control, relinquishing what I have tried to work out for my benefit. Help me relinquish control and just simply submit. And in that submission, find great freedom and great joy as I watch You work abundant provision on my behalf. Father, I thank you that according to scripture, you've revealed this is how you work. This is what you do. And so we release ourselves into your hand. Help us trust you. And as we do, reveal to us how you are working on our behalf for your glory and our benefit. We love you, Jesus. Help us love you more. In your name I pray, amen. Let's sing.